We're going to pop that open. And really well Thank done. You. Thank you so much. Right. Okay, we're stuck. <laughs> okay, we're going to need some help. <laughs> Welcome to Translogic, I'm Jonathan Buckley. GM is a company that's been around since 1908. To say that the technology used to design and manufacture their vehicles over the last 100 plus years has merely evolved is a massive understatement. Today's technology would absolutely melt the mind of a turn of the century employee. So let's see what they've been up to. We're here with Stephen Powell, and first off, I just want to say thank you so much for having us here at the GM Design Centre. You're very welcome. Such a historic building, and I'm kind of geeking out a little bit right now. I'll let you explain your title, because it's quite the mouthful. You are the... I'm the Virtual Reality Creative Digital Imaging Technology and Hardware IT Lead. All right, so Steve, we're here today to talk about the VR Cave in particular. You have some pretty advanced VR tech here on campus that you're working with, don't you? Yeah, so CAVE is an acronym, actually stands for CAVE Automatic Virtual Environment. And here at General Motors, we have um, a three-sided cave plus a floor. So what we do is vehicle interiors, mostly inside this cave. So the designers can actually come in, sit down uh, in a full-size representation made of light and evaluate things like aesthetic, fit, finish, function, reach to help them design the car faster than what they're designing today without so much building the physical prototype, which is right. very expensive. We're in the VR cave, and I have to put my goggles on right now. So these are just 3D goggles, is that right, right. Tristan? Yeah, it basically is like any of the um, Oculus Rift type, you know, style glasses here. It allows you to actually be fully submersed in the interior, it gives you a really good representation of what it really feels like um, when you're sitting in the car, and it gives you a great opportunity as designers to really try out different things to the interior space right. and experience it you know, kind of live, you know, and make these changes, make the right decision, rather than kind of using just a traditional image to kind of do the work. Your designers must be super excited right. about this type of thing. I mean, honestly, it must be like an absolute playground for them. Yeah, they're they're really excited because, you know, they don't have to wait for a clay model to be produced. Yeah. They can uh, develop math surfaces in, uh, in our CAD applications. They can bring them directly to us. Uh, we can blow them up to full size or whatever scale they want, put them in the cave immediately and actually have them evaluate what they've just done. So this is where they pitch. They get in there, they go, hop in the driver's seat. Look, yeah. this is what it looks like in beige. Oh, I can see we're changing the color of the interior now, which yep. is nice. So this is another wow. tool we're able to do where we can really evaluate what, when you do different color blocking in the interior, what does this really feel like? And what, how does that put different emphasis on different design elements in the interior? You know, I yeah. think some of the other colors were really highlighting this cockpit shape. This one's this more kind of full dipped interior where the full color is wow. all the way across. What does this do for development cycles? Does it speed up the process? It absolutely does. It allows them to actually iterate more too. Uh, yeah. There's not a lot of time nor budget in a program to do every what if scenario. Yeah. But when you do it in math and you do it virtually, you can do many more in the same amount of time. Well, it's got to be exciting times working at GM and particularly in the world of virtual reality. Absolutely. Which yep. I feel like, do you think that this is going to be the big thing, virtual reality? Oh yeah, it's going to keep growing. Uh, we have augmented reality, mixed reality. These are new systems that are coming online with HMDs. There's just the whole world opening up right now. All right, I'm in science fiction heaven here at GM's robotics testing site. I'm with uh, Marnie Lin, who is the uh, principal robotics engineer. Fair General to say. General Motors, yes. General Motors. And standing in front of what is known as R2 here, or Robonaut 2. Robonaut 2. So Robonaut 2 is, is really, if you will, the love child of General Motors and the NASA Johnson Space Center. How does a government agency like NASA and a company like GM meet up and come up with an idea like this? Well, it's, it's interesting because both NASA and General Motors shared a common dream, the common dream of having machines and people work together. Really, out of that whole whole dream and vision, we came up with the idea to actually develop the best humanoid robot, the best human safe robot in the world, and that's Robonaut 2. 
You mentioned space. We already have one up in space. So this isn't just like a, an example of what we can do for fun. This is a fully functional robot that's at work in the space station right now. That's right. NASA had the opportunity to send one of these robots to the International Space Station, and they did so back in 2011. So it's still a resident up there. It's a scientific experiment, frankly, uh, for NASA to be able to see how humans and the robot interact. What can R2 do, just quickly? Well, let me show you kind of the some of the base technology of this. Face. Yeah, you can face him, and yeah. I'm going to stand right here. Okay. So if I'm working next to him, yep. and I'm standing right here, <laughs> and he's actually trying to then go off, and he runs into me. So I can actually overpower and over torque. So he's now right. holding position, yep. and he's waiting until he can actually get all of the joints to the right position. So now I let him go, and he goes off at half speed because yep. he, his alarm system sensed that that something was amiss. Something was actually not getting to position. So now he's actually showing those guns off. <laughs> so he's, and oh, oh, now, coming. there's a good example <laughs> where he hit you, yep. and he came down, and it was unexpected contact, and it caused an e-stop of the robot. So with everything we've learned from R2, where does that lead to? We've been able to take the ideas within R2, the human safe part and the dexterity part that we spent a lot of time developing and drive them into equipment that we're gonna use in the plant floor. So what we've done is we've taken the tendon-driven actuators, we developed this device called a RoboGlove, and it's really a wearable robotic. That wearable robotic allows us to take the power of the robot and apply it to a person to be able to help them grasp objects better and do their jobs better. I'm here with Johan Ingvast, who's the founder of BioServo. Now, you've been specializing in what you've termed a soft exoskeleton. That's right, yeah. Right. Particularly you know, with gloves. Yeah. Do you yeah. know what exoskeleton is? Well, when I think of exoskeleton, I think of like mech warrior suits that you go and battle. Yeah, you probably climb into something very yeah. hard, steely thing. But it's soft exoskeleton, we don't add a structure. We okay. just use like fabric and add force by having tendons instead. So we've got tendons inside the glove and this one was developed by GM. Right. So this one's known as RoboGlove? Correct. Okay, so RoboGlove was designed with what purpose in mind? It was designed to help people in factories, in production, in, in a manufacturing line. You also have a glove, now this is the SEM glove? SEM glove, correct. Yeah, we call it soft extra muscle glove. Okay, and what is the difference between Robo Glove and SEM glove? Well, the purpose from the beginning is different. Right. We, we come from sort of more of a healthcare part. Okay. So our customers are those who have had injuries of different kinds, so they don't have a strength in the hand. Right. So they have some mobility, but not the strength. So we add these with tendons, so they get strong enough to do everyday life tasks. Yeah. And in some situation, they're able to get back to work. Can you give us a quick crash course of how this works? Sure, I'll, I'll uh, show on this one. Okay. We have motors there, computers, right. batteries. So everything, the main nuts and bolts are housed within this carry pack? Yeah. Yep. So and we have a, what we call a bowling cable going up to the glove. Yep. And here there are wires running that can pull on tendons running around here. And I can actually demonstrate that. So we have the tendons coming here. And if I wow. pull that, yeah. I bend my finger. So very similar to what we actually have within our own hands anyway. These are just artificial. Exactly. OK. Exactly. That's what we mimic. OK. And so using the motors and the battery pack, we can actuate those tendons in the glove. Exactly. And then we have sensors at the fingertips to know whether we should pull on those or not. Right, so you can actually grab something and the pressure points on the fingertips will sense pressure and then add more pressure add to more. that. more, so it's in proportion. If I grasp harder, it will help more. Wow, and adjusts according to that. Yeah. Shall, we, shall we arm wrestle? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that really is some stuff straight out of science fiction, but it's not all surface level flash. The Robo Glove and the VR Studio are clearly practical and logical tools to help build a better automobile. And that's really what it's all about. For Translogic, I'm Jonathan Buckley. We'll catch you next time.